Hello, my friends. Welcome to The Gathering. I am David Alt. And if you're new here or if you have been following me for a while, you may realize that I am overseas for an extended period of time. Um, much of that has been about this organization, Kaleidoscope Child Foundation, and the work that we do in promoting and creating global education opportunities in vulnerable territories around the world. This particular trip has been the first since the, the global experience of COVID where large groups have come. We've had a, quite, quite a number of people come to Cambodia and then some of those people continued on here to India where this is my last day in Bodh Gaya where our schools are. And uh, so it's my first day to begin to personally process, process the exhaustion, process the reflection of the victories that we as a collective were able to participate in and hopefully bring solution to, even if it's temporary, and to also process the dynamics of conflict that happen in a group dynamic. Um, there's this, this quote that I found by an English philosopher and sociologist. His name is Herbert Spencer. And you may not know his name, Herbert Spencer, but you are familiar with the term that he coined, and that's called survival of the fittest. <laughs> as, a, as a sociologist and a philosopher and, and a teacher and a writer and all of the things that come with a creative mind, um, Herbert Spencer came to the awareness that to coin the phrase survival of the fittest is not enough because it seems as though um, you know some people will make it and some people won't and that's just the nature of the beast but what he came to realize from the sociological and moral aspect was that those who have have an obligation have a calling have a a moral duty, if you will, to be able to assist those who do not. And it seems very cut and dry with what he's talking about, and I want to bring nuance to that, because he also went to say that the great aim of education is not knowledge, but action. Not knowledge, of, but the great aim of education is not knowledge, but action. So that, to me, means the application of the intellectual hypo hypotheses and, and issues that are put it on a printed page. None of it means anything. So I can take that from a literal standpoint, and I can look at the work that we do with these children and these communities, and I can say the aim of our education and our initiatives is not merely knowledge and talking at them, but it's bringing, it's bringing application, and hopefully from application, repetition, and hopefully from repetition, an embodiment of what it means uh, to make this a new part of one's life with regards to, to uh, literacy and hygiene and all of those kinds of things. But it also, reflects upon us within the group, the Western group, and our, our spiritual um, knowledge. The things that we profess to be in the world, the, the uh, identities that we claim to have. You know, I claim, I share that I've been a leader or have been in a leadership role for half my life. A lot of it has not been good. It has not been fun. It has been a constant shedding, a constant humbling, a constant dark night of the soul, repetition, staying up at night, over responsibilitizing, looking at how my own lack of healing or my own um, full knowledge of my wounding and my themes are overlaying and muddying leadership. And when one does not have curiosity to go, wow, what is my role in this? Then leadership is, becomes an even greater exhaustive battle 
where we're constantly pointing fingers and saying, it's you, it's you, it's you. It's, it's taking um, efforts that someone might offer with regards to, let's say, a campaign for awareness, and then telling them what they're doing wrong, and telling other people how they're doing it wrong, and blaming institutions, and blaming individuals, and blaming everybody how, for how <coughs> they are doing it wrong, because there's been no humbling and no pause and no accountability with regards to the commonality of the accusations and the experience. So <clears throat> the great aim of education, not classroom education, but spiritual education and consciousness education, evolution, self-awareness, <clears throat> is not from knowledge and not from talking points. It comes from action. And I have to say that I have witnessed people in the most dire situations in, the, in this travel experience show me the most beautiful examples of action. Brings me to tears sometimes when I think about people who were um, uncomfortable, uncomfortable with what can I do, um, who had a, a great amount of insecurity with regards to their capabilities to show up anyway. And in that showing up anyway, the action and the experience that developed and was birthed from showing up is far more greater than the noise and the talking points that a lot of other people continue to just bring to the table. And so I'm inspired by that. And what I want you to, to realize is that life is, the, the, the best way to navigate this human experience together is to become a part of the ensemble, not the party of one. The, great leader, the greatest leadership I'm, I have come to realize is not, oh, look at me, I am the leader, I am the party of one, I am the end all be all, buck stops here, uh, knowledge that is going to right the wrongs or you must do as I say, is that a great leaders become, learn how to become a part of the ensemble. They learn how to listen. They learn how to pick their battles. A lot of times those who are the noisiest demand attention. And in circumstances like our group dynamic, there were so many things, so many details, so many behind the scenes things that needed to be taken care of on a day-to-day -day basis <clears throat> that there is no time to answer every indiscretion and every noise that someone is emitting. And that's what I mean by pick your battles. In the, in the years of leadership, particularly in spiritual communities, there's always going to be disgruntlement among one or a collective and one must learn to pick their battles one must become strategic in their battles and say you know if I stop everything and put all of my attention to this disgruntlement what happens to the immediacy of the need that is before me I think you can understand what I'm talking about <clears throat> and so there's a strategy involved with the noise and a, and a and a detail that must be addressed to those who are understanding and nurturing and developing their ensemble nature. The commonality about people who understand what it means to be a part of the ensemble, that understand quantumly what no separation means, <clears throat> does not mean that they don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean that they just allow the noise to run all the way through them, but they quietly do what is needed to do in order to preserve their activity in the ensemble. I'm questioning myself right now whether I'm being too abstract, but I'm, I'm hoping that you can understand this distinction about the people who have ensemble consciousness and the people who have party of one consciousness. All you have to do is to just observe and you will see it.
in grand display. And I'm finding as the years progress, as this thing called leadership doesn't seem to have an end, <clears throat> that I, I, want, I want to always have a, the ensemble consciousness around me. I want to protect it, I want to preserve it, I want to nurture it, I want to keep it. And I realize that life doesn't work that way that there will always be barking dogs, that we will give them a place at the table and they still will not understand what it means to be a part of the ensemble. They will still find something about everyone or everything to nitpick and pull apart. And so, here's the bigger lesson. It isn't about completely shutting them all out because that takes effort and that effort will become futile because they're just a part of the fabric. But it does become, at the end of the day, celebrating those who understand what it means to be a part of the greater collective, of the ensemble, to see the work at hand. And they don't ask themselves, what's in it for me? They don't walk away from a, a situation becoming incredibly strategic about what they can get out of it for themselves. They walk away going, how can I support this? In this analogy, I'm obviously talking about kaleidoscope, but I'm also talking about spiritual community. I'm talking about the true meaning of seva, the people who show up in selfless service. That's what seva means. I'm sure we all know that. But you can see people who show up with regards to what's in it for me. One can only hope in their service, in their service of the party of one, that there's a, an awakening, that there is, a, there is some coming, coming to terms with the reality that they are the common denominator. Um, <clears throat> so I realize I've been out of practice with the, the intensity of leadership that was required for this trip, this month-long activity of people. So I don't walk away defeated. I don't walk away deflated because the good far outweighs the bad. But I do walk away continuing to question and be curious about why does this keep showing up for me? And what is my what is mine to do with that? Um, I don't know all of the answers, but I do know that it calls me to learn to lean in more and more and more into educating myself and educating others about the necessity for being in the ensemble. It's funny, right? The, in, in theater terms, the ensemble is back there they are the ones who are just sort of fillers. But in the true reality of life, the ensemble is the glue. It's the people who actually are a part of the foundation of what lasts. And those who are all about see me, see me, um, they come and go. They come and go. They burn out. They are like meteors that make big noises as they come in and then they exit. But those who embrace the idea of being a part of the ensemble, those who understand that the great aim of education or the great aim of being in humanity is not knowledge and talking points. It's, it's action. It's the way in which one lives. It's recognizing and understanding as Herbert Spencer learned in the ongoing evolution of all of his intellect, that it isn't so much just survival of the fittest, period. It's that those who are surviving and those who are thriving have an, have a, an obligation, a, a moral obligation, a, a soulful duty to continue to help lift others up. The ensemble consciousness gets that to get that. I got to witness that so beautifully. I have made so many incredibly new, 
deep friendships um, that I know will be long lasting, of which is a treasured gift. <clears throat> and so I don't throw that part away, but it energizes my duty as a teacher to continue to talk about that, educate about that, live from that, and hopefully inspire you to do the same. So we'll be leaving in a few hours. There are two more of our Indian friends who will thankfully <laughs> accompany us as we navigate the Indian train system and we go up north and um, gonna chill for a couple of weeks. I'm gonna regain some of my <clears throat> bronchial health, physical health, mental quiet, uh, return to some of the writing and the things that I am devoting myself to in the coming year. And I will just end by saying thank you. Thank you again to all of the people who follow, who donate, who have supported either me personally or Kaleidoscope. It goes without saying that those who have gone that extra mile, who have tangibly supported and given, made all of the activities, everything from water wells to school supplies to the educational initiatives that we taught, you made that possible. And I will always be indebted to you for your generosity. Thank you so much. And uh, let's go be a part of the ensemble. Blessings. <laughs>